or whether um, you have, there's separation. Uh, you may be caring for your adult, um, for, your, for your folks, um, and they're living someplace else and you're trying to manage your caregiving responsibilities. There's so much going on and, um, but it's a big job. And I hope that I can give you some suggestions and hints about um, just how to make that caregiving a bit more manageable. Um, particularly now with the time of COVID, we have even more stresses and more concerns about how we're going to give provide our care and where we're going to do that caregiving. Um, lots of living options that you need to navigate and hopefully I can help you at least know what some of the options are. So depending on whether you're caregiving for a spouse or caregiving for someone who is not living in your home, um, there are lots of options for you to consider. And I know that depending on your circumstances and your loved one's circumstances, some of the things I talk about aren't gonna relate, but I know that there's a wide variety of locations for caregiving. Um, you can do that caregiving in your home where the person you're caring for is living with you, but you don't have to do it by yourself. We'll talk about how you can get outside care to assist you in that caregiving, or whether you're going to have family assist you uh, in that caregiving and how does that work, uh, whether you want to move um, in with the person you're caregiving if you're not living with them currently. And I'll talk a bit about multi-generational uh, caregiving situation. But sometimes we can't stay at home with our caregiver. I mean, with the person we're caring for. So we have to think about other options and that might be an active adult community or it might be an age restricted community. It might be into what we call a continuing care retirement community or it may be within assisted living or even within a nursing home. And I'll give you some of the little highlights along the way. Don't have time to go into the great detail that I do in my book, Wise Moves. But let's see um, what I can offer you as suggestions, particularly if your loved one is at home in the same home with you. Whether caregiving comes upon you gradually as it might do with dementia is in my situation or whether the caregiving responsibilities come on um, Suddenly, let's say, um, like, for example, with my mother, uh, she fell and broke her hip and she was no longer able to uh, just stay at home by herself. And caregiving had to take place within her home. But if you're caregiving in the loved one's home, you need to be sure that it's ready and as efficient as possible for you to carry out your caregiving responsibilities. And it's important to make sure that um, it's accessible to your loved one's um, mobility needs if there are issues. Make a quick survey around the house to make sure that uh, let's say, uh, someone's coming home from the hospital or coming home from rehab. Um, is that safe? Uh, we had that situation myself uh, when my husband had um, 30 days in, in rehab and then was coming home um, the, before he could have a safe discharge from rehab, we had to make sure that basically suddenly was it going to fit his new needs? So look for, um, are, step, are there steps? 
Are there appropriate handrails? Are they at the right level? Are they secure? Do they have sufficient um, space between the wall and wherever the handrail might be for a good grip? Um, are there um, safety or slip uh, safety issues such as slippery rugs? I had to pull up all of my um, uh, loose rugs uh, just because of the tripping hazard. Look for um, corners or tables that might be in the way. Um, even it, if you if your loved one's going to be using a walker, is there sufficient turning spaces? Can they safely get into the bathroom? Um, or um, and one of the things that I had to do in my bathroom was to put those suction cup handrails in in the the bathroom so that there were firm places for um, my husband to grab a hold of and um, um, making sure because the bathroom we all know is has lots of hard surfaces and many slippery surfaces so the bathroom is an excellent place really to make sure that it is accessible um, and that it is safe. Uh, look for other safety issues that might be other than just uh, steps and surfaces. Uh, are the uh, cooking surfaces um, going to be safe? Are there ways that you can, if the your loved one is going to continue to be cooking, um, are there, are plates and pots and pans accessible and within reach? And does the stove um, have safety precautions on it so that there are um, um, less hazards with pots being left on the stove or um, difficulty in reaching the controls to turn them on or off? It may be that you're, um, oh, let's see. But remember that even if you're caring for your loved one at home, you don't have to do it all alone. There are so many options that I found important to me in being able to care for my husband while he was at home. And if I were not, if you are caregiving for someone who is not, you know, living with you, uh, you especially need to know that there are many volunteer services such as at Shepherds where uh, you can uh, call on someone to do friendly visiting or to just to check in on the person to make sure if they're living alone that they are are safe. Uh, call on um, uh, your family and neighbors and the faith community for um, opportunities to have you have an extra helping hand. Uh, when someone says, what can I do to help? I think it's handy to have a list. Well, uh, sometimes you really don't know what you need, but it could be just something as simple as uh, picking up groceries or picking up the dry cleaning or running errands, getting um, over-the-counter medications from the uh, drugstore, uh, whatever it is that will make your life easier. Don't think that you are failing as a caregiver if you call in resources and others to help. One of the other considerations that you should have is if when caregiving gets, whether it's remotely or in your own home, you may need to call um, when volunteer services aren't enough to really give you the relief and the assistance that you need. You may need to hire uh, someone to come into your house. And you really have uh, two basic options on 
um, hiring someone, you can either hire them directly yourself, um, or you can engage the services of home health care agency. Um, there are pros and cons with both, and I go into great detail about the issues, uh, the legal issues that surround um, both hiring through an agency or hiring yourself. It may sound cheaper and easier to hire yourself, but there are lots of reasons why going through an agency may be more appropriate. The key thing is that um, there are lots of legal issues about hiring someone yourself. You need to be sure that you're going to be um, um, equipped or able to manage the um, social, the taxes that you need to withhold, the social security, the, the FICA, the uh, unemployment compensation, uh, and the insurance issues that um, are typically taken care of through an agency. However, during the time of COVID, we have to put on sort of another uh, screening device about making sure that whomever you bring into your home, whether it's directly or through an agency, is uh, willing and um, affirmatively and aggressively using the safety precautions. Um, one of the concerns with um, that we've seen through COVID is the, um, the risk that um, the person that you're bringing into your home to care, help you care for someone, um, they may be going from location to location to location. And are they uh, sanitizing using, um, using masks? Are they taking their temperature? How strictly is the agency enforcing uh, the wellness of the care providers to make sure that there's not uh, cross-contamination or spreading of the virus uh, from home to home. Um, one of the um, great help that I have that is just makes my life and my husband's life so much better is through adult daycare. My hus husband goes to adult daycare uh, five days a week, nine to five. Um, and it is wonderful to give me the opportunity to do the other things that I want to do. But even for him, it is so important. Of course, uh, during um, March to July or August, uh, the daycare was closed. And I was so um, glad when daycare became open again so that he would have that routine um, that they provide, the socialization that they provide, the medical care, uh, the nursing, well, not medical care, but nursing care that they provide in making sure that he and um, the other uh, people who come for daycare um, are well taken care of. Uh, he gets delicious meals and he really enjoys all of the activities and socialization that provides. Um, that routine, at least for my husband's condition, is so very um, important and is so helpful. Um, it's not necessarily respite care per se, respite care for me, but you, you as a caregiver need to um, take advantage of respite care if you are uh, getting burned out, if you are having difficulty um, uh, getting, staying well yourself. There are a wide variety of respite care options. They're a little harder to find right now during COVID, but um, talk with um, uh, Shepherd Center, your support group, with the Area Agency on Aging to find out what respite care services are now available.
another thing that may be very important is to consider whether you want to live with family. Um, we originally, um, when my husband first got his diagnosis, uh, thought that maybe we would um, move in with our daughter and um, bought a, a great big house with lots of bedrooms and we tried multi-generational living. Unfortunately, it didn't work for my husband. And so we had to um, move into just a really little, we live in a little cottage in town in Bridgewater. It's a town of what about three or 4,000. Um, but if you moving in with, with family members or having family members move into you certainly can be an option that can really relieve the stress of, of caregiving. Uh, you do need to make sure ahead of time that you talk out how the budgeting is going to be and what the trade-offs are going to be for privacy and space, as well as who's going to be paying uh, for, for what. Um, if you're not going to, um, just one of the other options, if moving in with family or if having family move in with you is not necessarily going to work in your family circumstances, you certainly can think about moving into um, an active adult uh, community or an age-restricted community. It's a way to provide companionship, and it also is an opportunity to downsize, which really makes um, all of our lives so much easier. I know that I'm, um, uh, okay, there we go. Um, I'm running out of, of time and I wanted to leave a little bit for, for questions. I know I haven't uh, covered um, the issues of uh, assisted living uh, in great detail. You can find it in the book, but I hope this will give you some hints and some ideas about ways that um, uh, you can um, get, think about where it is that you are going to provide uh, your loving caregiving. And I'd be glad to take uh, some questions if, um, uh, Scott, you want to open up whether, I don't know whether uh, we have um, um, a chat capability or if you want to feed me some questions. So go ahead and uh, drop your screen sharing and we can get everybody, uh, there we go. Um, I don't see anything in chat. But yeah, I think we can let people just ask questions um, themselves, unmute themselves and ask questions. I'll start with a question. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, ways to make a home more accessible, uh, resources, services you may use, uh, key things to think about? Um, and I know it depends a little bit on each individual's status, of course, in terms of what their uh, physical or mental capabilities are, but maybe you can give, give us some general ideas about that. Thanks. Well, again, as you said, Scott, it really depends on what your circumstances are, but to make your house more accessible, um, what do you need to install a ramp to get in through stairs? Are there ways um, in, in our home, what we were able to do was to find a, a, a small house that doesn't have any stairs. And my husband uh, has his bedroom and his um, um, sort of TV room, office room, as well as the bathroom and the kitchen are all on, on one floor. And one floor really makes um, uh, life a whole lot easier for him and for me in that he can, um, uh, navigate. Um, other ways to um, make, do you, you need to consider uh, if there's going to be a, a, a permanent walker or a wheelchair, um, how to get from uh, space to space. 
Are the uh, doorways wide enough? Is there enough space in the in the bathroom? I know um, <laughs> in in our current house, if my husband were in a wheelchair, he would not be able to access the bathroom. So we recognize that if a wheelchair does become necessary, our current living situation is not going to work. We're going to have to move someplace. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, does one go about getting a copy of your book? Yes. Um, my book, uh, again, is uh, Wise Moves, and it's available from Amazon. And um, you can just type in Wise Moves or my name is, again, uh, uh, Sally Hermie, H-U-R-M-E. And also, if you have questions, I'd certainly be glad just to answer them if you want to send them by email. And my email is very simple. It's sallyhermie1 at gmail.com. Uh, S-A-L-L-Y-H-U-R-M-E-1 at gmail.com. Thank you. Sally, I just had one personal question. My sister, uh, Joan Kenny, lives in Bridgewater. She's, oh, she does. He's the choir director at the Methodist Church. I don't know if you go to that church, but uh, we we go to Stanton to the to the Episcopal Church. But that's great to know that there's a neighbor in Bridgewater. You know what a wonderful little community it is. Yes, yes, we've been there a number of times, uh, but uh, I didn't know if you'd know her. But, right, but. it's sure Bridgewater uh, certainly beats the community the commute that I had for all those years in Northern Virginia. I'm sure it does, yes. I can walk everywhere. Mm -hmm. Sally, I had another question. Okay. Um, and you talked about this a little bit in the presentation, but I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on when you're looking at a, a home health care agency looking for aids of various sorts uh, in the home, can you elaborate a little bit maybe on uh, key things to look for, key questions to ask? I mean, you, again, you, the area... Uh the, the era of COVID has added a few extras, but I'm thinking sort of in general, COVID or no COVID, what sorts of things do you need to pay attention to? Even before COVID and all of its extra layers of, of concern and, and uh, uh, precautions, uh, vetting the home care agency, I think is um, very important to make sure that there is a good match that they really appreciate the kind of care needs and that there's a very thorough assessment. Um, because my, uh, just for example, because my husband has, doesn't have Alzheimer's, I have to be sure in talking about uh, hiring caregivers, if they appreciate the, um, specific nature of, of his issues. Um, his memory is perfectly fine, but the judgment is gravely impaired. So um, that conversation with um, the, um, the agency, what is their experience? You want to know what sort of record keeping they will have. You want to make sure one of the good things about going through an agency is what is their um, a replacement. If, if, if an aide is not able to come on a particular day, what do they have as, as backup? Um, will they be able to provide the hours that you need? Do you need every day or do you just need help let's say in the afternoon or do you need assistance at night what uh scheduling uh accommodations are they going to be able to make um so i sort of think their their 
their philosophy, their experience, and the extent of their staffing flexibility are the primary things that I think you can get from a home health care agency. Thank you. Be sure you take a good look at we'll the play. contract so that you understand what um, they are going to provide and what they cannot provide and what are their, um, uh, you know, what's reading the, con I'm a lawyer, read the contract very carefully and do talk to more than one um, uh, agency uh, depending on the availability within your community. Uh, down here, we don't have that many choices. Uh, in uh, Northern Virginia, you ought to have a multitude of choices and interview more than one. Is there going to be good chemistry um, between uh, the management and the actual aids that are provided? Thank you. I saw Linda had a question. Did we get you unmuted okay, Linda? Yeah, I, I believe so. Um, Sally, I see that you're, um, with your bio, you're an elder law attorney. Yes. I know this is not quite on the topic of uh, caring for your loved one at home, but I was just wondering, um, as a matter of fact, I was looking at the AARP news this morning and talking about um, the need for wills and power of yes. attorney, et cetera, and to make sure that a person is licensed in in your state and now we're debating between a fairly simple situation financially you know setting up a trust will would you be available for hire or how actually actually that is a perfect segue because that's exactly what i'm going to talk about in the third segment in um uh december i uh, December 7th, maybe. Uh, and that's ex exactly what I'm going to talk about. Uh, when being just a caregiver is not enough, what other legal authorization do you need through powers of attorney, guardianship, uh, advanced directives, trusts, and so forth. So, uh, uh, find out exactly when Shepard's going to have its session three, and I'll be back. Eight. Eight. It's the eighth. Eight. It's the eighth it's the of Tuesday, December. Tuesday, December eighth. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Um, all right. Then I think we will move on to our second segment. Uh, Anne Marie with um, Navy Federal is going to explain to us all about financial fraud. <laughs> Very interesting. So I'm going to pass it off to you. Thank you so much, Sally. That was very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hi. So my name is Anne Marie, and I am with membership with Navy Federal Credit Union. And thank you so much for inviting me to the discussion this morning. Navy Federal is so pleased to be a member. Of and assets. And um, I think we'll continue. We'll talk about that some more. I, I see that there's a lot of new faces. And so um, let's just go through that once again, because it's such an important topic. Yeah, I, I find it very unfortunate that with all of the good people and the good things going on, it, it's just true that there are also some bad. And Fraud is growing. Um, I think during this time of COVID, maybe even more so, finding new ways to target people in new and interesting ways. So uh, we'll talk about some of those. I, I also invite you all to visit navyfederal.org, our website where there are resources, uh, wonderful articles, videos, tips about financial wellness, all the topics that are of interest to all of us. 
And there's um, when when you go to the resource page, for example, there's a drop down box and you can see all the topics that are available and you can choose one. For instance, security. That's a topic which will talk all about the different ways of protecting yourself in this day and age from fraud. So security is a great, great drop down for you all to pick. So, you know, Fraudsters, they target all age groups, but they do particularly tend to target seniors. And the more seniors are using technology, that's another way for them to reach out to our, our senior group. Uh, but you know, they, they attack young people just as much. In fact, since we serve the military, we see that there's a lot of targeting of the military because they're looking for a way in to your life, right? So with the military, they find that oh, they may be away for long periods of time. They may not be able to pay as much attention to what's going on with their account. They may not be getting their bank statements, their mail. Um, they're busy serving the country. So that's, that's appealing to a fraudster because they can find a way in. Um, but you know, seniors, unfortunately, they're, they're looking to target them because, for so many reasons. Like I said, more and more seniors are using technology. Um, that's one way to get you get to you. Some seniors are are having trouble with cognitive um, diseases, um, with impairments, and so it's terrible. But they they are preying on that. Now, one way that a criminal really starts to try to get to a person is to play on your emotions and your basic human vulnerabilities. And again, with seniors, this can be particularly upsetting and distressing. And this is what they do. You'll find that these criminals will either be extremely kind and friendly and overly familiar. They're their instant best friend. And how does this happen? Well, they may call on the phone, very common phone calls. Um, best way to start a conversation with, with you and get you to start trusting them. They may email, um, also very, very common. So you have to just kind of keep your guard up. If, if a person's behavior feels disingenuous, it probably very well may be. Um, and since we're talking about all of this, I, 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 since the last time I, I met with you all, I, I've been really paying attention a lot. I, I have a father-in-law who is very ill and we've been visiting him a lot. He, he is at home. Um, all the things Sally was just talking about, we, we've been focusing on keeping him safe and secure and as comfortable as possible at home. And I've noticed that my mother-in-law, his wife, uh, as I'm observing how she's handling a lot of new people in the home, new caregivers, delivery people, I, I've been observing her a lot and I noticed that she's a great example of a person who's very, very trusting. She's not jaded, you know, she has this open vulnerability because she truly loves people and she believes everyone really wants to help her. She does not use a computer, she does not use a cell phone. So she's not really savvy about everything that's been going on. She's not doing the kind of reading that some of us may be. But this trusting nature, you know, could cause problems because if people are kind to her, she would tell them anything, she would give them anything. And just observing her just made me think about these conversations that we have that, um, 
it's important to, no matter how trusting and how kind hearted you are to, to, to be aware, to just be aware that not everyone wants to help you out. So um, the other thing criminals will do that sometimes instead of being kind, being soft, being friendly, they just go right to it with bullying techniques, pressuring techniques. Um, I just received a call on my cell phone. It was a voice message and it stated angrily that I will be receiving an arrest warrant if I do not call them back immediately, that I have not paid my taxes with the IRS and they are sending an arrest warrant out for me. And they were angry and, and forceful on this voice message and very, very upsetting. But of course it wasn't real. Um, I think I told everyone last time that I got a similar voice message from the electric company saying that I haven't paid my bill and my electric will be turned off very shortly. And it's kind of crazy that even though I know I've paid my bills, it's still, it was that momentary upsetment and, and it's this pressure to act and I haven't done something I'm supposed to do and now my electric's going down and I need my electric, you know? And um, so uh, uh, part of the tactics that criminals will do is this, they'll knock you off balance with this pressure, with this, uh, you must act now. And um, it can be scary, it really can. And it can be very anxiety provoking. And remember that they reach you through your phone, through the internet, your email, even on your doorstep. You know, we have to be careful about who we answer the door for even. Um, they can pose as a fake charity. They can claim you have a family member in trouble who needs money, who needs help. Uh, they can be thrilled and happy on the phone telling you, you won this amazing prize. You just need to give them some information and your account number. Um, if you receive a call that is unexpected, just be wary. If they are asking for your personal information, just hang up. We have to know that no, no honest, legitimate, reputable business will call you asking for your personal information. They will not. Um, emails, sure signs that something's wrong in an email. If there's poor English, poor gram grammar, spelling mistakes, these are common sure signs in emails that are not legitimate. If there's a link in an email and you don't know who this person is, please never click on it, never open it. Those links can be very, very dangerous. Um, they can cause a virus in your computer um, or just if you don't know the source of an email and there's a link, please don't click on it, just delete it. So you may say to yourself, oh my goodness, it's coming from you from all places. And here's the, here's the best advice I could ever give. Just slow down, just breathe, just like the topic of our conversations, just like the title of these seminars, just breathe, it's normal to feel uncomfortable, to feel pressured, to have that heart racing feeling that, oh, I have to act, oh, something going on. You don't have to, just slow down. These are my golden rules. Three steps. Number one, slow down and let your instincts lead you. Your instincts will tell you they will, they'll, they'll serve you well. Number two, verify. If someone says they're your bank, but you're just not feeling sure about that, if they're asking you questions that you don't feel comfortable with, tell them you'll call them back. 
pull the published number and verify that this is a true legitimate phone call. Number three, just stop. No reputable person or organization will demand you, will pressure you to do something instantly, ever. It's just not ever going to happen that way. Those pressuring techniques can very often be a, be a source of fraud. So slow down, breathe, verify, stop. Together we can stay safe and win by sharing information, by having open discussions, by having this heightened sense of awareness, we will not be fooled. Again, there's so many resources about this on NavyFederal.org. You can really enjoy using that. You know, I want to share because Sally made me think of this also. I was using one of those resources recently, just two weeks ago. I went to the Estate Planning and Account Settlement resource. And it gives some very basic advice on the kind of things that you wanna start thinking about, wills, trusts, powers of attorney. So I created my will and I'm very proud of myself because it was long overdue and I was thinking I really, really need to do this. And I did it. And um, the way I did it, I sat with an attorney and it was very simple because <laughs> So my, my financial picture is very simple, but it felt really good to get that piece in place. And um, I've noticed that ever since, you know, COVID and talking with you, talking with all kinds of groups during virtual meetings, that people are sharing a lot more. I noticed within my family that family members are looking for more advice and to really talk about money issues, planning, um, young people, seniors, everyone in between is doing a lot of talking. And I thought that was really a great thing. So I, I kind of wanted to talk to you guys too about, I've noticed that as we get older and we've had all this experience and all these life lessons with money, with general finances, with buying homes, with paying bills, that we're a great resource for our family members who might be younger and are just starting out. And this is such a great thing to talk about, to really, um, especially during COVID, you know, the young people see people have lost jobs, businesses are struggling. This may be, a, well, I know it is a very huge message that they're living through in their lifetime during this pandemic that times can be very tough with finances. And when something unexpected like this happens, thing, the toughness escalates so much because they're seeing their people struggle. They're seeing businesses close. They're seeing their friends' families struggle. So one of the greatest joys for me is when young people ask for advice. And I just want to mention to everyone, you know, anyone asks for advice, the first thing I say to themselves is pay yourself first. The emergency savings account has become the tool of the moment, we all talk about it, but no, no more than, more important than ever, sorry, more important than ever is that emergency savings account. Pay yourself first and no matter what your age, you know, um, when my son was a young boy, I had him save 50% of any gift money he got. He got to spend a little bit of it and save a little bit of it. And he bought a house very early on because he learned that money lesson very early. Uh, there are great tools available for you to help children and grandchildren learn. Uh, one of my favorites is the compound interest calculator. So you can just type that into a search engine, compound interest calculator. One of the first ones that comes up is called Money Chimp, happens to be my favorite. It's very simple to use. 
And you can show young people how over time the money will grow. It's called the magic of compounding. It's amazing how over all the years that they have, small bits of money can really add up to something very significant in their life. And that when they have that money set aside, it's going to give them a great sense of security that is huge during unexpected times like this, during any times, there will always be unexpected expenses. So um, thank you. I just want to kind of segue into that because as I was talking to you guys last time, I, I, and since then I've lived through so many different things with my own family between the younger people looking for advice and my senior parents needing help and so many things uh, have just come to mind. So thank you. Does anyone have any questions or anything else that you would like to discuss as far as finances? If you have questions, remember to unmute yourself first. <laughs> I have a little question. Okay. <laughs> so these are obviously delicate conversations to have with family members, but can you talk a little bit about um, ways to safeguard uh, particularly elderly family members who you may be concerned about um, from a financial perspective, the sorts of surveillance, co-signatory, um, other mechanisms of sort of watching their finances. And I know you can get you can get very aggressive about these things or a little less aggressive, but, and I'm talking about, you know, credit cards and checking accounts and retirement accounts and other financial resources, how to um, keep an eye on them um, for safety purposes. Oh yes. And this is a, an important topic, but very touchy. It can be, it's so, it's one of those topics that if you can begin to have this conversation as early as possible, let me say, in my case, I noticed that now my in-laws are very, very ill and it's very tough to have this conversation now. Um, they're very opposed to it. Their God is up. So the earlier you can start those conversations, the better. Um, yeah, because let's face it, nobody wants to feel like their, their freedom and their independence is taken away or that they are unable to handle their own financial business or any business. And, and that's the biggest problem. So having the conversations early, get becoming a joint owner, or at least, and this is very useful, the power of attorney. It's a great tool. If, if you can convince your parent, grandparent, whoever it is, to uh, allow you to be their attorney, in fact, to be able to handle their business if they should need it at some point, that's, that's a wonderful tool. Um, of course, even better is joint ownership, because if, if you are a joint owner on the accounts, you can easily do whatever is necessary. Uh, establishing trust, that's, that's going to be the key, you know, so that's why I say early on, before a person is suffering a very bad illness or is their cognitive abilities are starting to diminish early on is the best time to have these conversations. And I know Sally will be talking next week. Uh, it's, it sounds like about other options that, you know, if, if, it, if it doesn't, if it, if it hasn't been worked out ahead of time, what are the options to take care of a person's business when you need to? But again, if, if you can do it early and you can, have that conversation, that's the best way. And establish the trust. The trust is everything. So in my family, the eldest son 
um, who just seems to work out that way. He's the eldest. He's, he's been the one entrusted with the money business. And so that's fine. That's working for everyone. And, and at least we've been able to take care of my parent, my in-laws bills and make sure their caregivers are paid and make sure everything gets done that needs to be done. So thank you for that question. Oh, also everybody, I'm from Navy Federal. I know I said that at first, um, to use our resources, you know, they are available to absolutely everyone, of course, on our website, navyfederal.org. But um, also if anyone is interested in what we have to offer, a membership or anything, you could always contact me directly. That would be fine too. What's your email? So my email is Anne, A-N-N-E, underscore Ferdinando. That's the hard part. Let me spell it. F-E-R-D-I-N-A-N-D-O, Ferdinando, at NavyFederal.org. I'd be happy to answer any questions or help anyone um, privately if you'd like. Absolutely. Thank you, Anne Marie. This is very informative. It's it's really sad that people are you know out there doing such bad things or trying to you know take advantage of our seniors or for our young people as far as that goes. But thank you. This is great information, Mom, and I think everybody learned a lot today from you. And thank Navy Federal for their support. Um, according welcome. to our agenda, we were going to move into a relaxation and breathing exercise. I'm not exactly sure what happened. Maybe our, our our relaxation person is too relaxed, but she, she's not on the call at the moment. So if we could move ahead and Jessica channel, um, can I ask you to, to maybe flip flop and, and you present now and hopefully Katie will be able to join us later. Sure. So this is Let me Jessica just channel. introduce uh, Jennifer. Oh, certainly. Uh, I'm sorry, Susan. Yeah, um, Jennifer is, um, this is a wonderful segment, um, Elements of Music, and, Jess and Jessica has graciously um, been offering music therapy every Thursday from two to three on Zoom. Um, and if you go to the Kensington Reston, um, you'll see our community resources and you can join Jessica um, and other programs as well at any time. But let me just say uh, a few words about Jessica channel who's a board certified music therapist with helping harmony music therapy. She's a Fairfax native and received her degree in music therapy from the Shenandoah University in Winchester, finishing with an internship as at Westminster at Westminster Canterbury, which is an assisted living home um, in the Shenandoah Valley. So she has a love of music and she has a love of seniors and what could be better than that for all of us. Um, her love with working um, with seniors and those with dementia started early when she was caring for her great aunt during college and uh, it became her specialty thereafter. So it's been a calling for her and it's very evident with the way Jessica chooses her music, how she speaks, everything about her. So we might not have breathing going on right now, but we're gonna have music and believe me, you'll all start breathing a little bit um, earlier. A little bit more, she co-founded um, Helping Harmony with her sister and brother-in-law and is happy to not only serve those with dementia, but a wide variety of populations, including being one of the very few music therapy assisted childbirth certified therapists on the East Coast. So Jessica now is settled in Winchester with her husband and two children, where she enjoys cooking, gardening, and caring for her flock of chickens. So again, um, the Kensington Restaurant is really happy to be part of this program. It's been wonderful. Um, and I turn it over to Jessica. Thank you, Susan. Well, hopefully um, I teach enough to you and we experience enough music to live up to that introduction. But um, I am Jessica Channel uh, with Helping Harmony Music Therapy and the Kensington has been uh, gracious enough to invite me to uh, speak with you all today. Um, and so I just like to start, we're going to do some relaxation with music, um, but I thought I'd start with kind of what music therapy is, um, since uh, most of my profession I found uh, people don't really know about it. It's an alternative therapy. 
Um, so it's not as widely known, but um, I might be a little biased, but I really uh, see the benefit in it. Uh, so music therapy, just like any other therapy, like physical therapy or occupational therapy, um, is conducted by a, a certified professional. So I'm a board certified music therapist. I went through uh, a degree in an accredited school and I've taken my boards like any other healthcare professional um, specific to my profession. Um, and then as a music therapist, I'm going to use the elements of music, rhythm, pitch, uh, melody, harmony, um, tempo, lyrics, um, or the words of songs um, to work on goals that are not related to music. So unlike a music teacher that's going to use all those elements to teach you more about music, um, I'm going to use them to address something like maybe you're, I'm going to work with your physical therapist to address gait. Um, your walking pattern, or I'm going to um, work with your speech therapist um, to get you some more repetition of using those mouth muscles, or I'm going to invite you to join um, a tone chime choir and maybe decrease um, the amount that you're isolated from other people. Of course, with the pandemic, that makes it a virtual uh, choir, but um, it's still getting, um, getting involved with um, other people. Um, it might be the goal of um, working with memory. Um, most of what I do works with um, cognition, so the different aspects of memory, short term, long term. Um, how do I remember the steps to this task? Or even um, how can I f um, work on focusing more or multitasking? Um, all those aspects of cognition. So music therapy is very broad on what we can work on which is uh, part of the reason that I love it. Um, and um, so today I just like to kind of go through what, especially with seniors, what we can work on with music therapy um, and just um, what you can do at home and what um, you could, um, what benefits working with a music therapist would be. Um, so uh, cognition, of course, I mentioned um, is just all of those brain related things that we um, that we deal with, um, whether it's um, remembering your shopping list or um, it's um, uh, late stage dementia, just, you know, um, being aware of your surroundings and interacting, you know, with some eye contact with a loved one. It has a wide range. So a music therapist um, might put your shopping list to a familiar tune. Um, because mem music is, it's processed all over our brains. So if we're having trouble remembering one way, uh, maybe the more orthodox way, we can reroute with music um, and make that our memory cue. Um, so I've written songs, um, procedural tasks, um, or just, I don't want to have to keep going back up and down stairs all day. What do I need to get done in the morning to make sure I don't have to go back up until the evening? Um, and I've written songs for clients where we take maybe their favorite tune from when they were in high school and we take out the words and we add new words and all of a sudden we have a song that um, cues us to, okay, I need to make sure I have my, maybe my cell phone. Um, I need to make sure that I've, you know, put my shoes on, anything like that. Shoes are always the part that I forget personally. Um, so I'm always running back upstairs for socks or shoes. So that was one thing that the client wanted to make sure he remembered. And so we just worked that all into a song that he could hum to himself as he got ready. And that was the memory cue. Um, music can work on all different types of attention. I used to think there were two types, paying attention and not. Um, but there are, are more. And so um, focused, alternating, divided attention, the, those multitasking aspects. Um, can I focus over here while somebody else is doing something? And if you've ever been in maybe a band or an orchestra or a choir, you realize how music can easily facilitate using those different um, pathways that process attention and just keeping them, trying to maintain them as long as we can as we age um, because one person's singing or playing one thing while you're doing another or you're trying to listen to one part versus another and pay attention to a, a, a conductor. And so in a music therapy setting, I would be, um, as the music therapist, I'd be like a conductor and we would do um, some sort of maybe group um, activity where we're doing lots of different things at one time through the music. Um, and that is just maintaining those neural pathways for us. 
Um, music therapy is great for socialization, reducing isolation. Um, a lot of music therapy, especially um, uh, with seniors, is done in a group setting, um, whether it be at an assisted living. Um, if you have a loved one who's in a, a care facility, I encourage you to reach out and see if they work with a music therapist or if they have one come in for groups. Um, that's what I do a lot is contract and come in for memory groups. And that's a wonderful opportunity just to get them out of their rooms. If you're at home, um, a lot of music therapists will offer groups um, out in the community as well. So it's worth taking a look into right now. Of course, a lot of that is virtual um, instead of in person. Um, which does make it a little different um, just with the techniques and things that we're able to do, but it's still a wonderful way to reduce that isolation and, and get um, in touch with others. And even working with a therapist one-on-one, -on -one, if you have goals that maybe aren't something that you can work on in a group, maybe it's your own physical well-being or something like that, working with a music therapist one-on-one -on -one is still a wonderful social connection um, in that uh, professional relationship. Um, Motor functioning is another thing that um, music therapy can address um, with seniors, whether it's you're recovering from a fall and maybe working with a physical therapist or you've been released from physical therapy and you'd like to do more to get maybe back up to where you feel um, you were um, before or you just need a little help getting motivated. Um, that's often what I do if I work um, alongside a physical therapist. Um, my my one, I work with one patient and uh, she is not very motivated to do her exercises because they hurt and they're, you know, repetition over and over. None of us like to do um, something that we're not particularly fond of over and over, but this that repetition that really is key to that rehabilitation. And so she loves John Philip Sousa marches. So taking her preferred music um, and pairing that with those exercises she's able to do more reps because she's not paying as much attention to what do I have to do? How many do I have left? Um, it's more, I'm just, you know, I'm doing this exercise to the beat and it, it's spurring her on. It's keeping her at the, the rate of those repetitions that the physical therapist wants. Um, and she's doing a lot more so that she gets that muscle tone back sooner, hopefully. Um, and then it just, um, along with that um, rhythm, provides, you know, it helps with our gait. Um, if, you, uh, if you're not feeling steady on your feet, a music therapist could work with you with pairing um, some music at the tempo of your gait. We would look at your gait and see, you know, okay, so this is the tempo. Now let's find a song that we can apply that steady rhythm um, and maybe reduce maybe some shuffling or hesitation. Um, so those are all physical things that we can work on. I've led music um, exercise groups, which are lots of fun. Um, just adding some instrument play um, into, um, into your exercise. You'd be surprised um, how much more fun uh, bicep curls are with a maraca than with a dumbbell. Um, and then the last thing that, um, kind of the last goal area, that, that non-musical goal area that we would work on um, is mood. So maybe it's calming agitation or anxiety, um, maybe uplifting your mood um, if you're feeling um, depressed or sad, um, providing that um, element you need for some relaxation. And we can do that all with music. And that's really what we're going to focus on today um, after, after I finish yakking. Um, so the benefits of working with a music therapist, music therapists are always going to, it's individualized care just like with any other um, professional um, it's going to be using your preferred music so we studies show that music between your teens and 20s is kind of the music overarchingly that you you prefer your whole life and some people that's different and um, that's something that you would tell your therapist and that I like this kind of music instead um, but your preferred music is always more motivating um, it, it spurs us to do more repetitions. It uh, elevates our mood a little bit more. Um, so using preferred music, making sure that all of your treatment is towards reaching that goal, um, whatever it whatever it is, um, memory or motor or mood. And then um, working maybe even with another healthcare professional that you're seeing or your treatment team. Um, or your care providers, um, just to make sure that you're you're getting 
um, the most quality of life um, throughout um, your treatment. And then um, we can write songs that are specific to you for memory cues, um, making sure that um, you know all of the, the elements of the music are specifically tailored towards reaching that goal. Um, so I would encourage you if you have, or if you're interested in music therapy, um, to look into music therapists, making sure they're board certified um, is really key. Um, so, and I think it will let me do it here. I forgot about this part and I didn't check it, but I do have um, the names of, this is the Music Therapy, uh, American Music Therapy Association, the certification board for music therapists. Um, those will all give you names of therapists who are in your area, um, practices and what they specialize in, um, a board certified music therapist that you could see, and of course, Helping Harmony. Um, we partner with the Kensington and we're always welcome or always willing to answer any questions about music therapy or obtaining a, uh, music therapy services for sure. Um, but those are all good resources um, when finding a music therapist. Um, and my email is there as well, and you can feel free to uh, reach out with any questions. Um, but music um, is accessible to all of us, and so you can use music at home um, without a music therapist and, and get some benefit out of that. Um, so you might take the words out of a favorite song and you know put the, the steps for that favorite holiday dessert in there so that you don't miss a step. Um, as you're going through making it or um, set your shopping list to a tune. Um, you can um, pull out CDs and records um, or if you listen on your phone on like Spotify or Pandora, um, pulling up the, those songs um, and, and using them maybe to start a conversation with family members. Um, you know, hey, what do you think of this song? I used to like this song or I really I heard this song on the radio. What do you think? Um, so just um, promoting some uh, communication and interaction within uh, family and friends. Um, you can use it to elevate your mood if, if you realize that you're maybe feeling a little bit down. Um, try to think of uh, maybe a time when you know you were really um, your mood was uplifted. Um, or a certain event that always makes you happy to think of and think of, is there any music that I associate with that? Maybe it was your wedding and a first dance song or, or a song that you listened to in high school or um, a song that your children liked to play or played at a piano recital. Something that, that gives you those um, more positive feelings and that can be a resource um, when you realize, hey, you know, I'm just, it's dreary out today. I'm, I'm not feeling as upbeat. Well, maybe putting on some of that type of music that you know you associate with positive memories that can elevate our mood um, and can be a real of real benefit. And then um, it can just also give us something to do while we're all so isolated and quarantined and everything. Listening to music or making music if you have played an instrument in the past um, and have stopped, it might be a good time to pick it back up and, you know, give yourself that continuing education aspect um, of music that music can offer. Um, anything like that is wonderful to do at home. Um, but relaxation, especially with music, is very accessible um, um, on your own. And so I would love to try some of that today. Um, we're going to um, we're going to do some chaining so you can experience kind of what working with a music therapist with relaxation might look like. And then um, we're going to do some music listening with some recorded music um, just to show you a little bit more of how you could do it on your own at home. So um, make sure I have all, all the pieces, parts I need here. All right. So the, the first thing I'd like to share with you, it's called chaining, and it is something I would do especially um, – um, if somebody was agitated or feeling anxious, um, you always want to kind of start with music that matches your mood. You don't want to go straight from, I'm feeling, you know, a little bit upset to, I'm going to play the Brahms lullaby and everything's going to be okay. That's very jarring to us at times. So oftentimes music therapists will work, um, through the, um, through music to the mood that we'd like to reach. 
and a lot of that has to do with the tempo. So we're gonna start with a song that's more upbeat, um, and we're just gonna chain some songs together um, that will offer us um, some decrease in tempo. So when you are seeking to relax to music, um, you want to make sure that you are trying to get to a song that has kind of that steady beat that's at the same rate of a second hand of a clock. So that's a that's the like the key. Um, 60 beats per minute is an ideal resting heart rate, and that can be different for people, especially with different conditions. Um, but that that's kind of the generic um, goal is that 60 beats per minute. So that's where we're going to try to get to today. So then we can go into some deep breathing with some recorded music. And because I've never met any of you before, um, I didn't know your preferred music. So we're going to do a little bit from a couple different genres. Um, if you know the song, you are welcome to sing at home because you're, you're muted and no one will, will think anything of your singing voice and you can sing as loud and as long as you want. Um, but you're also more than welcome to listen. And the first songs are more upbeat. You can tap your toes. But as we slow that tempo down, I'd encourage you maybe to just kind of focus on your breathing. You can close your eyes if you'd like to. Um, but getting into that relaxed mindset as we go. All right, so hopefully 60s pop isn't too offensive to anybody because that's where we're going to start. Now I've got a guy and his name is Dooley. He's my guy and I love him truly. He's not good looking, heaven knows, but I'm wild about his crazy clothes. He wears tan shoes with pink shoelaces, a polka dot vest and man oh man. He's got tan shoes with pink shoelaces and a big Panama with a purple hat band. with pink shoelaces, a polka dot vest, and man oh man, he wears tan shoes with pink shoelaces, and a big Panama with a purple hat band. So kind of in a condensed version, you can see why 
how you can go from one kind of tempo to another and hopefully you're feeling um, a little bit more relaxed with that and hopefully the way music works is it, it's going to draw your breathing down to that tempo and hopefully your heart rate will entrain to that tempo as well and that just promotes that feeling of relaxation because everything is a little bit calmer. Um, and so since we are hopefully more relaxed, we're going to do a little music listening to end my, my portion. Um, and so um, I've picked a piece that, that has a nice, it has nice musical phrases. So if, if you have studied music or played music at all, the musical phrases that build upon each other, or just if you think about the, kind of the ebbing and flowing of the ocean, this music does that quite a bit. It, it grows in intensity and, and fades away. And we're gonna use that to kind of um, focus our breathing, um, promote a little bit of deep breathing um, as we go. And again, you're welcome to close your eyes or um, keep them open, sway to the music. But let's go ahead and get that started and hopefully it won't be too loud. As we listen, it's a beautiful song called Forest Hymn. Um, and as you listen, just think of what instruments do you hear? Um, maybe do you like the song, or is it going to take some time to grow on you? Progress. We're going to start with some deep breaths in for three counts and then back out. And here we go. In, two, three, and out. Two, three. After a few of those deep breaths, we don't want to make ourselves like headed, so go ahead and try to breathe naturally again along with that music. Keeping breathing with the music, we're going to take a couple more deep breaths. Here in just a moment. Right. And here we go. And in. Out. to elongate those out your breaths a little bit longer than those inner ones. Again, let your breathing return to whatever feels comfortable to you. You can keep deep breathing if you'd like, but you can also turn your attention back to those instruments and let that become your focus. fades, you can slowly open your eyes if they were closed and return your attention to the present. So hopefully even in that condensed version you can see how at home you could use music um, just as a relaxation tool or even just for enjoyment. I know the first song I picked, um, I don't know if it was familiar to anyone, but I found it was just very fun and upbeat. And so that's a nice one to just kind of pick up your mood 
um, and elevate it a little or use music to relax and calm your breathing as well. So does anybody have any questions, comments? I just, or concerns? I just have a comment that you just gave me a great idea for the holidays to make sure that when we're having meals or we're all getting together that there's this rotation of different genres of music um, so that everybody that is a guest there will feel what we all just felt. I mean, the minute you went to the Beach Boys, you had me. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, what a great idea to just throughout the entire visit of families being together or whatever, that you're just playing the music from, you said, when you're in your 20s or 30s, it seems to... 20s is, seems to be yeah. the, the most preferred of, of people. And well, I thank you for that tip. I had kids, and then I realized that that's kind of when you stop listening to your music and the wheel right. comes on. Yeah. So that, that made a lot more sense to me now. But yes, from your teens and 20s, um, tends to be you, you have very fond memories with it. Um, and so you can pick those that you know you associate something positive with. Well, thanks for the tip. Yes, Linda. I think you're still muted. Need to unmute, Linda, unmute. Can you unmute yourself, Linda? Oh. Okay. There you go. Jessica, I just wanted to say everything that you've said about musical therapy is just spot on. Um, through a Facebook post, there is a post about a former ballerina who now has Alzheimer's and I think she's in her eighties. And um, it says she remembers her routine to Swan Lake. It's oh. a phenomenal video that as she sits in her um, wheelchair, she actually does all the exact movements with the exception of standing up to this music. So just, amazing i'm a firm believer in it and you have a lovely voice oh, thank you it's amazing how our memories can be connected to music and just how it routes around some of the the areas of the brain that might be be having more trouble i um, mean that it's a great way to reminisce as well just along the lines of that ballerina how she remembers her routine oftentimes we can um even with dementia and things um individuals can remember events or family members and begin to talk a little bit more and have a much more meaningful interaction um, if music can spur that on. Any other questions? Are there any other questions, Scott? Yes, I, of course I have a question. I always have questions. That's good. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Jessica, that was great. I'm, I, I, without getting too technical, I wonder if you can get into a little, I'm sure there's research, I'm talking specifically about music and stress or depression and mood. Um, maybe there's functional MRI studies or something that's, are there certain types of music or certain instruments or certain uh, melodies or certain rhythms that are particularly useful in alleviating either stress, anxiety or depression or some combination of those? Um, so, um in regard, like there are study, multiple studies on some of that um, uh, in regards to anxiety, um, kind of the, the research shows kind of what we worked on today, starting with the, the tempos that match more of that ang anxious feeling, that higher heart rate, um, and then decreasing um, yeah. because our hearts can entrain to the music um, that can really help reduce those feelings of anxiety because you're reducing that heart rate and clearing your mind. Um, there's been studies on music and mindfulness to reduce um, depression and anxiety. Um, I don't um, know of any MRI studies specifically um, um, off the top of my head, but um, uh, just using um, the music to, to change your mood has been, been studied. Um, in, in Avenue. Um, and you'll have to excuse me. I have mom brain, so I don't know if I completely answered your question. That's fine. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, I, do, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you, Jessica, because that was incredibly beautiful. And I just, I'm blown away by what you do. That is beautiful. Um, I looked it up online while you were singing and there's all kinds of musical therapy options up here in New York. 
and I'm going to let my whole family know. So just thank you. Incredible. I agree. That was very informative and you do have a lovely voice. So we got to relax a little bit anyhow. That was fabulous. I totally enjoyed it. I think everybody else did too. Um, anything else? Anybody else have questions about anything? Um, oh, we're screen sharing again. Anyhow, well, thank you every, to everybody so much for joining us today and particularly to our sponsors and our speakers. I learned a lot today. This was fabulous. Our third and final um, webinar will be December uh, 8th. It's a Tuesday. Uh, if you're while you're thinking about it, you might want to go online and, or call us and sign up right now. Uh, Sally will be back. Um, I'm not sure of the lineup for everybody else. Anne-Marie, Anne are you back? I don't know. Um, uh, well, we will be sending you the, the up, updated schedule once we have it. Um, there will be three or four more uh, informed speakers. Uh, so thank you again. We appreciate it. We did record this and it will be posted on our website and probably YouTube, I believe. Uh, so if you wanted to, to listen again, uh, you have that opportunity. So thank you so much. I appreciate everybody. Have a good day. Bye -bye. Thanks, Jane and Scott. Absolutely. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care.